Drought conscious San Diegans will be rewarded for impressive conservation efforts with a 40% hike in their water rates. Fat Leonard, the outsized character in the big Navy bribery scandal, is still singing as federal investigators ensnare some top Navy brass. And an Otay Mesa property is the source of a very long-running city lawsuit, which was settled this week nearly 30 years after it began. I'm Mark Sauer. The KBBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are reporter Rye Rivard of Voice of San Diego. Hi, Rye. Hey, Mark. Welcome. It's good to see you. Watchdog reporter Greg Moran of the San Diego Union Tribune. Greg, good to have you back. Good to see you, Mark. Good to see you on the show. And Laura Wingard, news and digital editor for KPBS. Hi, Laura. Hi, Mark. Glad to have you today. Well, congratulations to all you water savers out there. Your conservation efforts in the teeth of California's severe drought just earned you a big fat hike in water rates. Ironies abound in the action taken by San Diego City Council this week, jacking water rates even as water use is way down. So, Rai, start with the specifics. How much are the rates going to go up? And it's going to uh, go up over time, right? Yeah, you're going to see a 40% increase uh, by 2020. Um, you're going to see about 16 17% in the next year. Um, and uh, you're going to have to pay it. <laughs> there's, that's, that's, there's no option. That's you know? the way it is. If you, I guess you don't have to have water. You don't need to bathe the drink. Otherwise, it's, it's up to us. Well, well, now what are the main reasons that water officials and city leaders are giving for the need for this? So you talked about the irony. The irony is when they sell less water, they have less money coming in from, from your bill. And when they have that, they say, well, we have these pipes that we have to take care of. We have this staff we have to pay. We have this water we have to uh, continue to buy. Uh, and those costs don't go down. In fact, sometimes they go up. And so less money, same relative amount of expenses, and uh, they just can't they just can't pay the bill without raising yours. Yeah, so they count on this stuff. They got all these, we've, we've heard a lot about water mains busting this aging infrastructure and the, all these lines that need to be replaced, et cetera. And as you say, even if the water can, uh, use is down, what, 20%, 20 plus percent yeah. uh, uh, since the governor issued that uh, call for action, um, but those those costs don't go away, and that's right. that's the irony of, of the whole thing. So there were some uh, odd political bedfellows in in this supporting the hikes so, here. Uh, we got you know noted uh, environmental attorney Marco Gonzalez, yeah. and he's siding with Mayor Faulkner. I don't see that very often, right? <laughs> so the main thing that they're partnering together over is the uh, city is arguing that if we don't get the water rate increase, one of the big projects we have on the table is this uh, recycled uh, water program where they're going to take uh, wastewater and make it drinkable. And the environmental uh, community really likes that because right now we're dumping not entirely treated water into the Pacific Ocean out of Point Loma. And if we don't start doing a larger recycled program to get you drinkable water from wastewater, um, the EPA, the federal government, is threatening to make us upgrade this other plant, which is old and aging, and that's going to cost $3 billion. So the environmentalists um, get some less water being dumped in the Pacific Ocean. Um, the city gets to avoid a 2 to $3 billion upgrade of a, of a treatment plant. And so that's sort of what brought them together on this one. And that's been kind of the sword hanging over the city for a long time, a long that $3 time. billion dollar upgrade, and what they're saying as well. Let's go to this. And how, remind us, what's the cost of uh, of this uh, treated uh, treated plant and this this water? And it's going to be about 15 years till that project's done. Yeah, well, they're gonna they're gonna try and bring some online in the early 2020s, um, but the total cost is going to be 2.5 to 3 billion dollars itself. But we get a benefit from it because we can drink the water. Whereas if we have to upgrade the Point Loma plant, we can't drink that water. It still goes into it the Pacific. Goes up. And how much, uh, how important will that water supply be when we get that treated water online and we can use uh, it? The city will say it's about uh, going to be about a third of our water by 2035. Okay, that's uh, so, Greg. Uh, one thing that struck me about the the, the race and the justification form about well, we have all this infrastructure that we uh, decided to build and have to build that 10 years ago, and with the paying that off is kind of based on the amount of revenue we get in. But if going forward, you know, we continue co to conserve and save water and mm. become more efficient at using it, are we? Just, is this going to be a perpetual problem? That in other words, there's always going to be less money coming in, but these fixed costs to pay these bonds and, and to pay the notes on these projects are always going to be there. I mean, this isn't 
Is this the end of these increases, or is this? It doesn't. Weird? It doesn't seem like it. And I think what they're sort of counting on is the idea that the city is going to grow, that more businesses are going to come in, more people are going to come in, so you're going to have a larger base of customers, and that you're going to be guaranteeing the ability to grow Southern California, even if there continue to be droughts. So they're they're banking on a sort of curve matching the price increase curve, an economic benefit that matches the, the cost on ratepayers. Laura? Well, I was seeing in comments <coughs> from real citizens that question about all this growth. Is that really wise? If we don't have enough water, we have an aging infrastructure that we can't maintain now without raising our rates a lot, does it make sense? I mean, what are they saying about that? Well, I mean, the point about real citizens is you had the, you know, seven of the nine city council members voting for this, but you had 20,000 people file protests saying we don't want this rate increase. Now, about 140,000 people need to, to file protests to, to have any effect on stopping the rate increase, but that's a lot of people. And, um, you know, it's a big city, but that's still a lot of people. And some, some of the average citizens were showing up and saying, look, I couldn't pay my bill as it is. My water shut off. I'm relying on, um, you know, uh, gallons of water from the store. Um, and so they're frustrated. Um, but I guess the, the sort of the reason that business interests and city political interests are interested in, um, in continuing to have e increasingly expensive water is you, you, you want to continue to see your city grow. And, and now, you mentioned uh, two of the uh, council members voted against it. Uh, tell us who they are and what their reasoning was. Well, uh, David Alvarez, he gave a pretty clear reason. He, he said his... Democrat, his, of course, we should yeah, say. Yeah. Uh, his constituents just, just can't take it. He thought the city could have come, um, the city water department could have come with a, a proposal that spared um, lower income citizens or, or particularly lower water users. So which a are different way to structure uh, an yeah, increase. Yeah. Could have spared them. Uh, and then Scott Sherman, who... Uh, a Republican, I should say. Yes. So again, it's odd. Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, I haven't talked to him about his reasons, but uh, every member, uh, pretty much every member of city council said, we, we, we hate to do this, but but those are the two that actually decided to do something about it. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> we're, we're patting ourselves on the back and conserving and all, and, and folks with this El Nino coming, we're going to get the rain buckets out and, and all of that. And got mine out. You got yours already. Rain very, barrel, I'm all set. Very good. You're all set. And then if we get a bunch of rain, you know, presumably people will use more water, be yeah. lax, and, and that's a double-edged sword too, right? I mean... Yes. Uh, so the, the water f folks might love to see us use more water in a way the governor and the environmentalists wouldn't, even though we get a wet year. It's well, the, the city uh, and the San Diego County Water Authority have both been lobbying the state, uh, which is imposing these uh, reductions on us to, to spare them, to allow us to use more water. And uh, we'll see that'll all play out next spring. All right, now we're talking about potable water here, of course, drinking water, but there's yes. there's another type of water, uh, the purple pipe stuff, which is treated, but it, you, you really can't drink it. You can water the golf course with it. Explain what that is, and there's really a r different rate structure for that, right? Yeah, and it's been it's been low. It's been about 20% um, of the, the price of drinking water, and that's to get golf courses to, to use it, to city parks departments to use it, public areas, public schools to mm -hmm. use it uh, on ball fields. And that price hasn't gone up for 15 years. And as a result of that, everybody that drinks drinking water and pays for drinking water has been subsidizing the lower priced non drinkable water, which is mainly used by um, these areas you discussed. Yeah. These areas. And, and, so and they're going to go up how much now, that, the price of that? Uh, it'll, it'll more than double. Yeah, okay, yeah. more than 100%. Yeah. So it could be worse, I guess, if you're a and, consumer. I mean, is that also kind of a disincentive to, to, to people? You know, we should be using the gray water, we should be using the purple pipe and things like that, but to, to crank it up, I mean, it just seems a lot of these policies kind of aren't in lockstep here, you know, that they're kind of working against each other in some ways. Well, the, the city of San Diego's non-drinkable water rates have been... Um, fairly artificially low since 2001, uh, and they've been about 20% again of the price of drinking water, whereas other cities um, have been able to set theirs at about 80 to 85% of the drinking water price. So even if you compare what we're doing to other districts, we could have raised, we could have raised the rate and not presumably seen much pain uh, for the people that are using it, although the people that are using it, uh, like some golf courses are saying, our business model was based on this very low price. So right. we'll, have to, we'll have to see. All right, and then we're going to have to leave it there on that segment and watch and see what happens with the rain and the use as we go forward. Well, he's an outsized figure with a boundless appetite for food and money. The man his Navy pals call Fat Leonard pleaded guilty to a bribery 
scheme in which taxpayers were fleeced of tens of millions of dollars. The far-flung investigation continues, a case that won't end as long as fat Leonard continues to sing. It seems Leonard's gifts of hookers and high life went a very long way with naval officers and pursers. And Greg, start with an overview. Who is this fellow called Fat Leonard, and well, uh, what's the scope of this? Well, this is Leonard Glenn Francis. He's a Malaysian citizen. He had a company called Glenn Defense Marine Asia that had, for a long time, had been providing something, uh, a service that I think is as old as, as ships on, on, the, on the sea, which is called husbanding or ship support services. You pull into a port, you need, you need water, you need fuel, you need you know, somebody to take the sewage off the thing, you need all kinds of stuff, and there are companies that provide this. Uh, Lender ran one that uh, the government says over about at least a 10-year period and maybe more, um, kind of systematically defrauded the Navy out of at least $35 million. That's the restitution, that he's, or that's the amount he's been ordered to forfeit by overbilling, inflated billing, kickback schemes, all kinds of things where they were just fleecing the Navy for these services uh, for a, a, a long period of time a scheme that he really effectuated largely by corrupting and bribing a whole number of people in the, in the Yeah, States. and it's it's interesting. You look at, um, at you know, your story and your breakdown, unpack that. It was really a surprisingly small number of key people that he was able to, uh, to manipulate. Yeah, from what we know now, if you look at everything that's in the public record now, and I think this is sort of an iceberg thing, we're seeing a tip and there's a lot more that, that we don't know yet, but if you line it up, it really didn't, I, I mean, it, I didn't mean to apply it, it didn't take much, but it, he was very, uh, smart about where the pressure points were that you had to get uh, people working for you uh, in a, what is a very far-flung operation. This was mostly centered on the Seventh Fleet, which operates in the Western Pacific, Asia. Uh, 48 million square miles is what the fleet is in charge of. It's a big area, a lot of islands. Well, Leonard had, you know, really about half a dozen points, uh, flip uh, uh, ship support centers, the command ship of, uh, and the command staff of the fleet, uh, contracting officials, operations people, you know, four or five locations, a number of people that he they had contacts with here, but it really didn't take a whole lot to be able to kind of get this scheme going and do it. Now, you mentioned uh, the 35. He has pleaded uh, guilty, and he's cooperating now. He is. He pleaded guilty almost a year ago now in January. And, and there are some, we don't need to detail all the folks here, but there are some folks uh, in the Navy who are also facing and, and have uh, pleaded out or they're facing criminal charges, and then some with lesser punishments right through the Navy. Right, procedures. and that, that's a good point. It's kind of going on two tracks, right? You have the criminal investigation, the criminal prosecutions, which are centered here in San Diego, where to have had, I think now, Leonard and I think seven other people have pleaded guilty, uh, several uniformed service personnel, commanders, captains, uh, things like that. At the same time, there is something going on inside the Navy called a Consolidated Disposition Board, which is taking uh, uh, the people who are somehow implicated or involved in the corruption, but not to the point where the government wants to charge them criminally. They're flipping them over to the Navy, and the Navy is taking care of them sort of administratively uh, and you know, damaging, if not ending, their careers. That's a part of the, the story in the investigation that's still very opaque. The Navy really won't say how many people they're dealing with. We know they've issued three letters of censure to uh, some rear admirals and some vice admirals. But, you know, uh, the military press has reported that as many as three dozen admirals mm -hmm. might be implicated here. And in one court hearing during the course of this case, which is now two years old, one of the prosecutors said there are as many as 200 people who there who are at some point you know involved in this. a lot of careers on the line here laura you edited a lot of these stories you're very familiar yes. with this uh, i wanted to ask you about how does how does this happen how do you not have the well, oversight on that's it? one of the things i wanted to ask greg about because i think one of the things that's astonishing about this is like in 2006 they had a whistleblower and they didn't act on it there was a a good soldier who said hey, these charges are way out of, line. Way out of mm -hmm. line, and the Navy ignored it. And I think it speaks to the culture of how things are going there. It, it's astonishing that they didn't so. act. Yeah, that's really kind of the larger story, is how the Navy really administers and oversees what's become a very expanded program, as all the services have, of contracting out to private companies uh, services and things that the services used to handle themselves. And in this case, in particular, that's a big issue. I mean, because there were not just the one person in 2006, but there are other indications in the record that people were raising their hand and saying, "Look, just a minute. What, what about this? This is ridiculous," and and they just couldn't get traction. Part of that is because 
Leonard had a lot of people running interference for him, kind of stopping this stuff as it goes. But there's also, you know, a real, I think, laxity. And that's what the Navy is dealing with. So this isn't the first contracting scandal that they've had to deal with, which, which goes to the heart of who's looking at the bills, who's really questioning these things. How are these things being forced through? That and, goes to a larger issue. And your story pointed out he also had an investigator uh, on the payroll, as it were, oh. where uh, he was getting tipped off about, hey, hey yeah. the heat's coming up here, watch out. An investigator with the Naval Criminal Investigation Service at one time, their agent of the year in Singapore in 2010, <laughs> who was doing nothing but feeding him reports about you're being investigated for this, coaching him on how to answer the questions telling them what to say and what not to say is pretty remarkable. Wow, that, that was, is remarkable. That was a key point in that whole well, scene. Uh, uh, well, and I was going to say, and it, and it didn't take him much. I mean, he'd just throw a party for a bunch of officers overseas, and they would pay, what, 40 or $50 for a $738 night in some fancy, you know, restaurant. And then he'd throw them a hooker here or there. And... Boom! He's Hotel making. Rooms. I love yeah. your, I love that line. Your story about the breadcrumbs we throw. The breadcrumbs. Yeah, little bread <laughs> he, he, he would apparently throw these parties. Very well known. He was well known in, in the in the area that the fleet uh, patrolled. But he would throw parties and, you know, kind of put stuff out there like a free bottle of scotch or you know here's something tickets to this or that, and people who took them you know, kind of got on the list of people we want to follow up on. If you didn't, then he stayed away from you. And that's kind of how this was explained to me by, by one uh, person who's real familiar with the investigation. That's how we began to kind of cultivate uh, sources. Now, before we leave this segment, I did want to bring up <clears throat> one point, and it's it's in the everything in the news today, of course, is terrorism, the terrible attacks a week ago in Paris, other attacks, more attacks today. And this has become, uh, uh, unfortunately, very uh, almost routine and horrifying, but with so many of these contractors out there and the Navy not vetting them, at least in money, what about in security? These folks coming in, they're providing security for ships, they have access to Navy and Navy personnel and bases. Uh, what confidence does, does this, do we have now with all of this stuff not being watched? Well, that's a great point because in this case, this is really about money at this point. He was policing him for money, but you know, one of the ways this worked was that he was he was able to get information on the on the movements of ships on the schedules of ships and there are some indications of the court records that he just wasn't getting information about where our ships were going to be in a week or 10 days or something but information about where the navies of other countries were going to be and things like that. I mean that is a huge security issue so, and, so a bribe comes his way and it's too much money to, you know, to refuse you know, and suddenly somebody's let in the back door exactly you know and he the very, very much I think that that's kind of a sort of the meta story here is like who who are we dealing business who are we doing business with how are we vetting them, and how are we staying on top of them? Who's watching these it? contractors? There's one thing to be, you know, bring a bunch of booze and, and fuel mm -hmm. to the ship. It's something else to, yeah. to, to come to Give come people there. access that's, and all of that. That's one of the implications of the story. Well, it's terrific stuff, and we'll watch your reporting go forward because I know this story is far from over. Well, we switch now from one colorful character in the news to another, and let's start with an announcement this week from City Attorney Jan Goldsmith. Trump is to the right. Hillary is to the left, and, and they both cover 20% of the spectrum. I'm going right straight in the middle for the 60%, and I'm going forward. All right, that was, <clears throat> excuse me, the wrong bite. We're getting ahead <laughs> of our story here. That was uh, Roque de la Fuente, and what we're going to talk about here was a deal struck nearly 30 years ago. It became the longest-running legal case in San Diego history, and as Goldsmith says, it was finally settled this week. The case involved, uh, and we'll get to Goldsmith in a minute, it did involve this other flamboyant character. It's Roque de la Fuente II. It's centered on a 312-acre plot in Otay Mesa, and we'll get to the terms of the settlement. We do have a goldsmith. Now, let's, let's, let's hear what the city attorney says. When I say that we were at, we turned coal into diamonds, what we did is we took all that bad stuff, all the, all the disputes and all the litigation. We have ended it. All right. Well, let's uh, start with uh, who is uh, Rocky De La Fuente? How did he make his money to begin with? Laura? Well, he's like a lot of people. He inherited it. <laughs> the um, old-fashioned way. The old-fashioned way. His family had a business. Uh, they had uh, car dealerships, real estate, that sort of thing. And he took it over in the 1980s, which was 
how this case came to be about because he bought this land, he, he bought this land in the mid 1980s and, and struck a deal with the city of San Diego. And, and what do you want to do? What were the specifics his plan for that? Land? Well, this land and, and tell us where it is. Yeah, it's, 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 it for. It, it's important to note it's on Airway Road mm -hmm. uh, and way near down the border, near the border, yeah. right near the border in Otay Mesa. And in the 1980s, that land was really not developed. Otay Mesa had not become like this huge housing development yet. But the city that was an area where they wanted to expand, develop that sort of thing. And so this was going to be a business park. It was going to be an industrial park. The city was going to build an airport on part of the land. Um, it was going to be a commerce center in, in South County, probably to offer jobs to some of the people who were going to be moving in there. Yeah, but, but bad things happened to Rocky's plan there. So what? tell us what happened in, in the midst of this agreement that caused him to sue. And this would have been about 10 years later in the mid-90s that right. the law, first lawsuit came. He felt like the city swindled him. They took advantage of him. Um, one thing, Airway Road, city going to build the, the airport there, doesn't build an airport. So it still sits on Airway Road, no airport. And he thought that was a key part of his development that he needed. And then the city put a truck route through his property to the border. And so then, you know, prospective, you know, businesses, they didn't want to be in there because it was just this clot of trucks. And we were out there this week and it's a clot of yeah. trucks <laughs> in that area. And so he said, you basically have rendered my land worthless. The city, on the other hand, said this guy just never lived up to any of the things that he agreed to do as part of the redevelopment of this piece of land. And uh, so it was a classic dispute. So, so Greg, you covered and looked at a lot of this story. They had a yeah. trial in 2001. Tell us what happened there. Well, they had a trial. And, uh, it was a, the main cause of action was what Laura described. as called inverse condemnation in, in the law. It means that you take actions to devalue the, the worth of a property so you can take it yourself rather than going through a regular condemnation. So you try to drive the value down so you get it cheap. He won on that. The jury agreed with Rocky. The jury went right down the road with Rocky to the tune of, I think it was a $91 million. Yeah, I think it's like a 90, 94.5, yes. Amount. I remember Huge the, amount of money. Amount of biggest verdict, I think, against the city maybe ever right. at that time. And, and they it, paid it right away, right? <laughs> they did not. <laughs> they did not, wisely, perhaps. But it did trigger, what, 15 Appeal. years right. of, of uh, appeals, negotiations. Over time, that initial big number verdict really got whittled down by the appellate. The meter course. was running, though, interest, and it was interest, up in the I mean, 120s or one. I remember, I wrote a story, yeah, at some point it was, the, with interest, if the city had paid, it would be $130 million or something. At one point, the former city attorney, Mike Aguirre, offered $50 million uh -huh. to settle. We just settle everything now. Nobody took that. And it just kind of kept, uh, I think uh, we refer to it as the zombie lawsuit. Mm -hmm. It just kind of kept going and going on. Its so own. the uh, mm -hmm. the uh, case was sent back to trial, and that was coming up here, right? Never that, a portion try it again. of it. Yeah, yeah. a okay. portion of the case. It's a complicated case. I think it was three different lawsuits, many causes of action, but but a portion of it was still alive and was going to go back mm -hmm. and could again have the potential for, I think, a pretty large verdict against the city, maybe not as long as before, and I think that's what they were able to settle out. All right, well, tell us about that settlement agreement then, Laura. What's, uh, what's in it? And this was the city attorney. Of course, he's, he's taking a victory lap there and maybe well-deserved, but he calls it a win-win. Tell us Coal about into diamonds. Yeah, <laughs> coal into diamonds. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it is a big deal when you think about the $50 yeah. million that at one point uh, Mike Aguirre was willing to offer. And you need to know, I mean, Mike Aguirre was not Former a fan. Former city of, attorney, we should say. Yeah. Right. He was not a fan of, of signing off. Nobody wanted to right. do this, but it was like, we need to let this go away because right. the city was in the middle of a huge financial crisis and this huge liability was looming. So what they end up getting is Rocky gets $25 million. Um, paid by former insurance carriers for the city, so no taxpayer dollars. But of that $25 million, $18 million he doesn't get until he makes repairs and uh, puts in sewer lines and things like that that the city had always wanted him to do. So he's got, a five, I think it's five years or you know, a certain amount of time that he has to do that work by, and then he'll get that. The city, meanwhile, got $12 million out of this, and um, but... Eight million. A lot of it's going to go to attorney fees yeah, and stuff like that. Like half of that's already been spent on oh, outside yeah. attorneys, yeah. right? So this, the general fund, I think, is going to get like three million dollars. But that's nothing to sneeze at when at one point you were on the hook for like one hundred and thirty-six exactly. million dollars. Right. So right. and right. it's all going to be paid by insurance carriers. And I know we kind of celebrate. I'm sure the insurance companies are not <laughs> celebrating. <laughs> and remember, we all have <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> insurance. Well, so. <laughs> we we can't end this segment without noting we said he was colorful at the start, and he's running for president. 
president. You may not know it. He's, he's a Democrat. He wasn't on the stage at the debate, but we have his commercial here. Let's see what, what this uh, looks like. You can hear all of that. Well, yeah. surprised at this? I think he might have a shot. What do you I think, think? Well, he's certainly got a war chest now. I guess he can, sell him and he, can, he, can, he can make some more commercials. And it takes away the negative hit from the ongoing it lawsuit. Does. Yeah. You got, I think it helps him in the polls. No and more opera I bet you Hillary's watching, don't you think? Oh, yeah. <laughs> think so. And, and I would say that great country. safe to say maybe a lot of people in San Diego weren't even aware of this candidate, much less the rest of the yeah, country right. at this point. Okay. All right. We are going to end it there. The case was settled, unlike the, uh, the whale of a case we talked, talked about before that involving our friend Fat Leonard. That does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Rye Rivard, Greg Moran, and Laura Wingard for joining me. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.